We are the cosmos made conscious, and life is the means by which the universe understands itself. It's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. The theory was that it began with Hurricane Harvey a few years ago in mid-August. The news media reported the flooding at 5,000 year high levels. The waters reached almost to the top of Black Cat Ridge. No one living knew of a time when the waters had been so high. Black Cat Ridge was an area mostly known just to older locals. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it had been an outlaw hangout. and During Prohibition, it served as a base for moonshiners. Still later, it hosted meth and designer drug labs. It was located above the San Jacinto River and caused the river to bend to the southwest. In recent decades, people had built homes, a hospital and even a college around the ridge. But the ridge and adjacent lands remained at a wooded, tangled, snake and gator infested nightmare, surrounded by swamps. There were even reports that cougars had returned to the area after a half-century absence. Plenty of other wildlife called the area home. Deers, coyotes, raccoons, opossums, feral hogs, feral dogs, and feral cats, to name a few. But plenty of birds and many small animals as well. There was a wetland across from the college campus that hosted a plethora of wildlife. Most of the campus had flooded during the storm and its immediate aftermath. Emergency workers and volunteers saw and had to clean up many animal carcasses left behind when the waters receded. It was nasty work and the water was contaminated not only from businesses and mills along the river, but with crud from the illicit manufactories on the lower parts of Black Cat Ridge. Still, over the next two years, things got better, and the police officers who patrolled the college and the officers and deputies who patrolled around it at night noted that the wildlife had rebounded soundly, especially the feral hog population. They'd started to become a road hazard, and tore up every landscaped area they could reach. Feral hogs had been tearing up property for years, yet they seemed to have gotten bolder about their predations since Harvey. One hot summer morning in 2018, the campus officer saw a large truck that cut through the main road adjacent to the campus at about five in the morning. It smacked into a feral sow and kept going, speeding of course. By the time she arrived, she saw that the sow was twitching its last. Her carcass rested there for a couple of days until animal control could remove it. It reeked immediately, since the intestines had burst and it was July. Oh, no one would go near the thing on foot. But from a car, one could see that the sow had been particularly large, and more hair covered her than was normal. She had tusks the size of a large male. Everyone agreed that it was just a freak and hoped that she'd had no piglets since the storm. Time marched forward. The campus and area businesses and homes were repaired. The swamp was deeper and more tangled than ever, and the gigantic mosquitoes that emerged from its waters were particularly aggressive. A rumour went around the campus that the mosquitoes had attacked and drained all the blood from a student in the far parking lot after night classes. It was salacious and false, of course. The student had suffered only a temporary anemia. One morning, a larger-than-average gator blocked the road that ran between the college and the wetland, and the school abandoned the wetland's observation platforms rather than repair them. But they'd used the indoor labs. The raccoons had gotten bigger and bolder, too. One actually snatched a lunch bag from a campus officer as he arrived for work and walked toward the office. He didn't dare challenge the creature when it stood on its hind legs and chittered threateningly at him. Everyone laughed it off, of course, and the officer simply had lunch in the cafeteria. No one noticed that, after the incident, he avoided the area around the trash cans where the raccoon had been waiting in ambush. Well, the students became less friendly toward the various stray and semi wild animals that populated the public areas, especially around the building with the cafeteria, where they had once come to beg for scraps. The animals had become large and aggressive. Even the normally elusive feral cats started to issue hissing challenges over territory and food. The wildest party of the wildlife, though, was a small sounder of feral hogs. They had definitely grown in stature. They looked different, too. All porcine relatives had hair, but, but these looked like woolly mammoth hogs from the Pleistocene era. Their tusks had grown, 
and when one could catch a glimpse, they'd see a knob of flesh and bone had grown between the eyes of the pigs. This was more than just a different strain of boar introduced into the local feral population. It was a significant evolution. By fall of 2020, night officers around the campus and hospital noted that the hogs had grown fearless. No amount of honking, siren whoops, or flashing lights would get them to move. Eventually, the officer would either have to take another route or get out of the vehicle and try to shoo them away from the area. That could be dangerous with any pigs when there were new piglets. The sounds were very protective. Yet until recently, that tactic had worked well enough. Officer G. Halek, a city officer, got out of his unit to try to chase away the notorious sounder of monster hogs. They'd stopped while crossing a larger roadway by the hospital and had blocked the ambulance entrance. Well, he had to get them to move, and they hadn't responded to his measures with noise and light. He removed the cartridge from his electronic control weapon and activated the charge to make a loud, sputtering crackle of electricity. Sometimes the frequency of that noise would convince critters to skedaddle. He saw that the largest hog in the Sounder of Five stood at least four feet tall at the shoulder and had to weigh near 500 pounds. It had abnormally long tusks. They looked to be about a foot long, jutting and gleaming in the headlights. The enormous porker stared him down and started to stalk menacingly toward him. He fled back to the car and decided to go another way. As he reversed, he felt an impact on his driver's side door, and the car slew to one side with the combined momentum. He corrected course and got the vehicle back so that he could turn and drive forward. However, as he shifted into drive, he saw that the big boar hog stood in front of his car and glared balefully at him through the windshield. The mane of bristled hair from its head, shoulders and back stood erect in a display of aggression. He swore that the monster hog locked eyes with him. <sighs> Definitely some kind of mutant, he thought, and mentally dubbed it the saber-toothed hog. The beast allowed him enough room to drive past and get to a lot near one of the buildings over a hundred yards from the sounder. He watched him hatefully the entire time. His door was jammed shut, and he had to clamber over his in-car computer and radio setup to crawl out of the passenger side. His driver door was crushed, and the steel was punctured and peeled open. Well, he had to write a lengthy report, and caught flack from both his supervisors and his co-workers. Later that week, he met up with the campus officer on the same shift over free coffee at a nearby convenience store. She didn't laugh at his account, but simply grew quiet as he told his tale. Then, finally, spoke up. I've noticed the changes. I've been on graveyards for a few years since the storm. The animals have changed, especially the swine. Yeah, that big male you mentioned. Looks like a mammoth without a trunk. They spent some time lamenting that they told their supervisors, but no one had done anything. Sami, the night clerk, overheard as he stocked the coffee counter. Yes, I have seen these monster pigs. Very frightening. Sometimes I'm afraid to take the trash to the dumpster. I can see them through the trees. They're too big. It's not normal. They discussed the hogs for a while, then attempted to resolve the rest of the world's problems before each returned to his or her respective duties. At around four in the morning, Sami had to take the trash to the dumpster on the dark side of the building. The trash truck would arrive around 4.30, and early morning customers shortly thereafter. He'd have help for the morning rush. His cousin Hamid would arrive at five. Hamid was the eldest of his uncle Mohammed's sons, was the day manager since Mohammed owned the franchise. Oh, at least I have work and family, he fumed as he dragged the heavy bags through the back door. His mind on other worries, he failed to note the glowing yellow eyes emanating from hulking silhouettes standing just inside the wood line behind the store. As he toppled the last bag over the side of the dumpster, Sami heard a loud grunt from the other side of the steel box. It was quickly followed by several more grunts and snuffles. The dumpster boomed as something struck it from the other side. It could have been anything from wild animals to feral people who lived in camps around the woods. 
Yet Sami had a sinking feeling that it was something else. He started to walk rapidly back toward the rear doorway of the building. A sweat sprung out on his forehead, and his eyes rolled in sudden fear. He was too afraid to look over his shoulder. He just wanted to focus on getting back inside. Sami didn't know he could fly, but he was suddenly airborne, telling ass overhead. He felt tremendous pain in his legs, and then he struck the asphalt, and the agonizing sensation in his left shoulder supplemented the pain from the back of his legs. At least, until a large, dark object bit into his right leg, and all other pains were forgotten as the bone shattered. He screamed in fear and agony. An enormous boar hog had clamped its maw around his leg at the knee joint. He tried to raise his torso, but his left forearm was seized by another set of jowls and savagely pointed teeth. His mind blanked for a moment, and then he began to scream again, this time mindlessly, as more teeth shredded his flesh, and the last thing he saw was the open mouth and gullet of the porcine horror as it clamped onto his face and crushed his skull. By the time the trash truck arrived, the sounder was gone, and there wasn't much left of Sammy, just a few pieces of bone and flesh and a large smudge of blood on the asphalt. The driver didn't notice. There were always wet spots in convenience store parking lots, especially around the dumpsters. He simply racked up the dumpster, emptied it into the truck container, and moved on to his next stop. Hamid arrived, just after five. He was habitually late since he knew that Sami wouldn't dare complain. Besides, he didn't want to have to help with the small chores necessary to begin the business day. He liked Sami well enough, but had his own responsibilities and future planned out. He was puzzled when he arrived and Sami was nowhere in sight. There were three customers at the counter, and two more roaming the aisles. They all looked confused and frustrated. The first in line had placed some bills on the counter, was writing a note on one of the napkins from the coffee counter as Hamid approached. Uh, uh, we haven't seen um, Sammy this morning. We've got to get to work. We didn't want to leave without paying or get him in trouble. He must be in the back somewhere. One of the other men in line spoke up. Yeah, maybe he ate one of those ancient burritos on the roller. That'd keep anyone on the job. <laughs> the other two laughed along with him. Hamid scowled and quickly set about ringing up the purchases. He took care of the stream of customers that didn't give him a break for the next few hours, all the time wondering what had happened to Sami. He had to call his father to get another employee to come in and help. No problem, he had other siblings, and at least one other person was already scheduled for the day shift and would arrive at six. God, where is that little rat? He wondered, until the morning rush finally gave way. He was actually a little concerned. This was very unlike Sammy. The young man was invariably on time and worked very diligently. The one time he had been out sick, he had the flu, and he still made it in after only a couple of days off and before he was well. He'd even made up the hours he'd missed. As soon as he had a break, Hummy took a look around the premises. Sammy was not in the back, and there was no one in the bathroom with its perpetual out-of-order sign. No one in the office. He'd even looked behind the desk. He finally decided to look around outside. Nothing but a large brown smear in the area near the dumpster. Ugh, Sammy should have hosed off whatever that was. Looks like old roadkill. He went back inside and pulled up the surveillance recordings. He fast-forwarded it until just before 4am. He saw Sammy speaking with two cops who'd come in to mooch free stale coffee. As soon as they left... Sami set up the coffee machine for a fresh batch. Then he gathered the trash and hefted it through the back door. There was no camera for the dark area by the dumpsters. No need. Who'd steal from a dumpster? Sami had kept watching. The cameras were motion activated, and the recording was empty until customers started to arrive. Well, Hamid spoke with his father, who was annoyed at Sami, but not too worried. Well, maybe he was angry at something. Maybe he's taken up smoking and knew better than to come back inside. Who knows? If he doesn't show up for his shift tonight, we can call the police. He, of course, didn't show. At around ten o'clock that evening, they finally called in that Sami was missing. It had been raining since the afternoon, 
Most of Sami was gone by the time Officer Halek arrived to take a report. He looked at the video recordings and looked around inside and outside the store. He questioned Hamid's younger brother, Adil, and set up a time for a day shift officer to interview Hamid and Mohammed. Sami was an adult, and there was no evidence of foul play. He took the bus to work, so no one had any idea where we would have gone, and the call was marked as low priority, no safety concerns. Two days later, Josh McClintock was out in the woods near the campus for the first day of squirrel season. He hoped to shoot a mess for the rodents for a dish of squirrel and dumplings. His wife Martha could still cook at 73, and he could still bring home hunted meat at 75. Life was good, so long as no one complained about him shooting so close to the campus. Oh, things had changed so much in his lifetime. Human expansion had encroached on the wild areas he'd known in his youth. He settled in near a large hardwood tree and waited for the animals to stir again after he disturbed them with his presence. Eventually birds began to once again flitter through the branches and sing their morning songs. A large raccoon waddled by on its way home before the sun was too high. It looked over its shoulder at him with a glare and gave him a sinister grin. It gave out a sharp little bark and stood on its hind legs and waddled on into the trees. Josh was dumbfounded. He rubbed his eyes. Shit, the old-timer's disease has me, and I've gone crazy. Maybe I just dozed off it. I haven't been up this early in a while. And then he saw a big red fox squirrel scuttle into sight on the trunk of a large oak to his left. Biggest he'd seen in years. The breed had gotten scarce even before Harvey. He unlimbered his 20 gay shotgun and slowly put it in position to fire on the hapless arboreal resident. Then he heard a loud rustle of brush from over his right shoulder. Something big had decided to move. The squirrel darted around to the other side of the tree, and the other birds and animals fell instantly silent. Josh shifted around, thinking, Oh shit, I'm caught. Private land, probably the owner. He decided to remain still. Maybe the guy would pass him. He darted his eyes around, trying to avoid moving the rest of his body, much the way squirrels freeze or try to hide on the far side of tree boles and then freeze. He heard heavy breathing behind him, and then a grunt and a snort. About that time a figure appeared to his front right. It had moved up silently through the trees. Ah, oh, stupid hog. You scared the shit out of me. Josh grouched. It was only then he registered how enormous the hog was. Yeah, this day is definitely a bust. The monstrous hog just stood there looking at him for a moment, then bristled and pawed the ground. John knew that his number four shot would just anger the animal, but he instinctively shifted the barrel of his shotgun toward the beast. That was when he felt the agony of a large tusk enter his lower abdomen and rip upward into his chest cavity. While he'd been watching the sow, the boar had spiked him. Martha was a widow before Josh's corpse even hit the leaves on the ground, and the sounder had another solid meal. By the next day, a search party combed the woods near the campus. Many were student volunteers. The search was called off after only a couple of hours. Well, the mosquitoes had swarmed the searchers, and one of them had a close call with a water moccasin. The cottonmouth chased her up into a tree and continually tried to strike at her. About the time it started to slither up the trunk, another searcher arrived. He had a walking stick with a metal tip and was able to spear the large reptile. And then he was in trouble. The snake didn't die and was so large and heavy that its strikes began to tear it loose from where it was pinned. Fortunately, the combined screams of the students brought over a campus officer who shot the thing several times and finally hit it in the head. It measured in at five feet long and was about six inches in diameter. Between the insane mosquitoes and enormous venomous reptiles, the local constabulary decided to restrict the search to first responders. About then it started to rain heavily and the search became moot. Dogs had tracked very close to where Josh had been posted, but something turned them from the scent and they either shied away or just sat or lay on the ground and whined. 
Since the county had been in charge of the search for Josh and the city had jurisdiction on Sami, the two cases were not linked beyond interagency gossip at the first line officer level. Josh was old and people assumed he'd gone out and had a heart attack or had fallen in some water or something. The story was quickly replaced by other events in local and national news. It was an election year after all and November was just around the corner. The rain finally gave up a few days later, and by evening there was nothing left of it but ground fog. Good night, buenos noches, Officer Therese called to the two cleaning crew members as the women made their way to the parking lot in tandem. He smiled in satisfaction. Apparently they decided to heed his advice that they should travel in pairs for safety. One never knew when a crook might pop up, or a wild coyote or feral domestic animal might approach. The ladies returned his wishes and walked away, chattering amicably as they made their way through the well-lit parking area. The officer went back inside. It was nearly ten o'clock and time for shift change. Most of the buildings were already locked. The women had nearly made it to their cars that were parked very close to one another in the employee lot when Esmeralda, the elder of the two, noticed them. In the strip of woods between the parking area and the roadway, were several sets of glowing yellow eyes set within large, dark silhouettes. She started to ask her young friend Jennifer if she saw them, but it was clear that she had since Jennifer had fallen silent, a rare occurrence in Esmeralda's experience with the girl. There were four sets of eyes that glared balefully from the shadows. The shaggy outlines moved forward slowly, as though stalking towards the women. Esmeralda moved first, Get in the car, Jenny, she called to the younger woman. Jennifer stood frozen in horror as the hairy brutes came into view. Esmeralda focused briefly on getting into her own pickup. She fumbled with the keys. I should have listened when the officer said to have your keys ready before you get to your vehicle. About that time, the rumble of hooves on pavement registered, and she looked up in time to see the dark shape that rushed at her from the well-lit parking area. She noted the glint of the tusk as it rose and entered her skull from below the chin. The impact was so fierce that it drove her back into the open truck door and tore the door from its hinges. By then, Jennifer was able to scream. The scream didn't last long as she was bowled over and trampled by a quartet of swine. Once they started to eat her alive, she was unable to make any noise other than a gurgle from her missing throat. Fortunately, she lost consciousness quickly. Twenty minutes later, as Officer Therese headed into the parking lot to go home for the evening, he saw that the vehicles that belonged to the cleaning crew ladies were still in the lot. He called over to the other officer who was headed towards his own car. Hey, Jay, do you see the cleaning ladies? Officer Johnson, Jay, looked up from the text he was typing, and without actually looking around said, Nope, just us chicken. Torres then registered the dark shapes moving through the thin line of trees behind the lot in the roadway. He saw the damage to Esmeralda's pickup, and his heart skipped a beat as he noticed the large puddles of blood and bits of soft tissue and bones scattered across the pavement. Oh, fuck, he said quietly, then shouted to Johnson. Get over here, help! He pulled out his flashlight and his sidearm and started walking quickly toward the horrific scene. He used his radio to contact dispatch and request assistance from the supervisor, who was still inside the office, and to send EMS. As he made it to Esmeralda's pickup, he saw that the dark shapes in the shadows of the pines had halted. And then, glowing eyes stared ominously toward him. Johnson approached quickly and panted out, On your left! Torres spared him a glance. The younger officer was winded from fear stress rather than physical exertion. Jay was in good shape and was on target with his sidearm. The officers used their flashlights to illuminate the faces that contained those terror-inducing eyes. What they saw was five sets of enormous porcine features smeared with fresh gall. There were scraps of bone and flesh on the ground near their feet. But most noticeably... The monsters looked angry at having had their repast so rudely interrupted. The big boar snorted loudly and pawed at the ground in front of him. His mane bristled. 
It was a warning. The officers had been hesitant to fire. They had clear policies on when to shoot at animals, but as the boar lowered its big, ugly head, Torres came to the conclusion that policy or not, this was an appropriate situation to shoot. He fired all the rounds in his 16-round magazine before the enormous pig struck him and bowled him over like he wasn't even an obstacle. As soon as Torres fired, Johnson joined in, in a reflexive reaction. He sprayed and prayed and emptied his magazine into the four other porkers. Jay shakily reloaded as the boar hog tore into his partner on the ground. Despite his sorry shooting, his targets had remained in place so he'd gotten in a lucky shot and taken out one of the largest hounds. She wasn't dead, but dying. Maybe Torres had hit her too. Jay had hit one of the other three in the right hip, and it was spinning around its own body with incredible speed, trying to locate the creature that had so viciously stung it. Eventually that one collapsed into the injured leg and had difficulty standing again. Officer Johnson didn't see all of that. The remaining two blasted into him before he could seat the second magazine. Well, they made short work of the two officers. Then, after they checked on the now dead sow, they quickly moved into the thicker woods across the road and headed back to their den to grieve, but with full bellies. The supervisor and night officer came out quickly in response to the radio call, but arrived only in time to watch as the sounder disappeared into the shadows. EMS arrived shortly, and then Life Flight arrived and transported Officer Johnson, who clung on to life by a thread. His left arm had been torn from his torso. Officer Torres only lasted a moment. His intestines were spilled onto the front of his pants. His vest had been made for bullet impacts rather than stabbing objects. The rest of his body was trampled, and it was clear that his ribs had been crushed. The supervisor held his hand as he breathed out the last part of a Hail Mary and expired. He'd managed to press record on his body camera just before he drew his side up. The video wasn't the greatest, and it mostly showed dark figures rushing and flailing, and the audio was mostly screams, grunts, and unpleasant sounds. Yet the frame-by-frame -frame review finally produced at least one clear photo, and thus was born the legend of the saber-toothed hog. It was an overnight hit on social media and in the press. There was evidence, at least from the meager remains of the cleaning crew, that the hogs had become human-eating predators. Investigators found porcine DNA in the mess that was Jennifer and on the uniforms of the responding officers. There were definite abnormalities that led to further testing. Someone puzzled out one of the abnormalities, and they drug-tested the samples. They found trace amounts of methamphetamine and ketamine. The assumption was that one or more of the victims had been using the substances. Officer Johnson somehow managed to survive, though he would require a lifetime of both physical and psychological therapy. But only wasn't much help with his recollection of that night. Oh, so much blood. Oh, those poor ladies. It was so big. He rounded in short, staccato sentences. He made a great media figure, though. Young, a military veteran. Jim Rat, handsome, at least as long as one viewed the before photos. He was set up for an experimental prosthesis, which made for an ongoing series in the local media, but that was a long while later. Once the various law enforcement agencies had enough information, the dots connected, and several missing persons cases were attributed to a suspected feral pig predation. The hunt was on for the sounder of mutant, saber-toothed hogs. Professional hunters volunteered by the hundreds. Every law enforcement jurisdiction and politician wanted in on it, and every nut with a firearm wanted to be the one to get the big boar as a trophy and for notoriety. The experts provided opinions and discussed various theories on why omnivorous creatures would suddenly become carnivorous predators. The primary consensus was that it had to do with climate change, oh, the popular theory for anything odd in nature. The campus became the center for the hunt, and classes were disrupted by the presence of so many emergency responders. Parents pulled students from classes at the campus because of safety concerns. Property became a zoo of humanity. 
The woods from the interstate highway to the river, and from the highway bridge north to a major FM road were closed. Neighbourhoods and businesses were put on mandatory curfews, and volunteer guards set out to patrol in their pickup trucks, complete with wannabe heroes perched in the beds with rifles and shotguns. Everyone was on guard for the hogs, except for the retired on active duty security guard posted at a local manufacturing business that had somehow evaded the floodwaters. His company had been contracted because of the hog murders. The atmosphere of fear had led to a boom in security contracts for the duration of the emergency. The guard's name was Fredericks, but everyone called him Gollum. Well, he looked like the movie version of that character, grown to six feet tall and aged around 45. He was unpleasant, irresponsible, and a know-it-all who actually knew very little. Fredericks ignored all the hoopla and hype. Any fool knows how to hunt feral hogs. Dumbasses, he thought as he slouched on his golf cart, semi-dozing next to his cup of coffee. His supervisor had told him to stay inside and not use the cart since the hogs were reported to be as large as the little vehicle. Fredericks didn't care. What did that little idiot know? Fredericks had been a real cop, a deputy for one of the local constable's offices for almost two years, before he'd been given the option to resign or be terminated. Well, he'd done security work ever since. None of these youngsters could tell him anything. He sat there, dozing and musing about what the other guards had meant when they called him Gollum. Something from some stupid movie, he mentally grumbled. Well, at least it wasn't Paul Blart, like when he'd used the Segway at the mall. And then a noise startled him fully awake. It was a splash. Then he heard a few more splashes and squelches of mud as he turned his ears to the sounds. There was a drainage ditch along the front of the property, part of the reason the waters had failed to inundate the main building of DMT Solutions Incorporated. Well, something or someone was approaching through the waters of the ditch. Maybe several somethings or somebodies, he thought. Ah, probably some idiot kids. When the head appeared above the ditch, Fredericks could not believe his eyes. It was gargantuan, bigger than any hog he'd ever seen. It was almost as big as the head of the rhino he'd seen at the zoo many years ago. Only this one had tusks like an elephant, rather than a horn on its nose, and a big bulging knob of a forehead. The head turned toward him, and he saw the yellow eyes focus on him in his little car. His bladder released, and without thinking or steering, he floored the drive pedal. The front of the cart faced the exit driveway, but the front wheels had been turned to the side away from the one with the rhino hog. Gollum was headed in the right direction, completely by accident. He rolled the golf cart directly off the driveway and into the deepest part of the ditch on the other side. The big boar hog let out a snort that sounded like laughter. By the time he and the rest of his sounder had made their way into the ditch on the other side of the driveway, their initial work was done. Fredericks lay in a heap on the dash of the cart. His heart had failed. The ferals left little of the man and destroyed the cart, but the remains were easy to spot when the first employee arrived for work the next morning. After all, the back half of a golf cart blocking the drive will tend to get one's attention. The hunt intensified. The sounder was down to two sounds. The one that left the college parking lot injured could not keep up with the rest and, after a few days of her lagging, ended up as a meal for the rest. The remaining two would bear litter soon. They'd all noticed that the more they preyed upon the two-legged creatures, the more they grew. They have just been eating so much protein, but they were all adults and should have stopped growing. Having such thoughts, and the ability to communicate them to one another, was something new and had only manifested in their generation. It may have had something to do with the knobs that had formed on their foreheads, and were covered heavily in bone. They'd found a low spot by the river, a little bend in a tributary creek that was damp without being full of water. They used it as a wallow, they always felt unusually energetic after a wallow in that spot. Well, their home was uphill, near the top of Black Cat Ridge. 
The flood left behind a large old oak just below the high water mark of the flood. The roots had come to rest over a low spot in the ground. With a little digging, they had made a nice den. Since then, the local weeds and brush had grown, and leaves and pine straw had fallen to provide some camouflage. It would be a nice safe place to raise a family. The two legs who had inundated the area in the past few days trounced past it without a glance. Hopefully they would leave soon. They'd started to travel in groups and carry weapons. If they didn't go away soon, the Sounder would have to take on a group of them, or leave altogether. <sighs> Don't know why the dogs won't track him, Travis said as he looked toward the other three members of his party. I do know that hardly anyone has looked up this way. Nobody likes going up hills. Ain't that high of a hill, but, well, folks are lazy. Travis was a volunteer with hunting and tracking experience. His friend Billy was in the group along with a deputy and a police officer from local agencies. They'd made their way up the ridge and over to the backside that faced away from settled areas and toward the river. Oh, thing is, if I was a hog, I'd hide as far away from people as I could. Billy snorted. You are a hog. A bear and pork rind hog, and you do live far away from other people. They shared a laugh. It was apparently an old exchange between them. The two police officers exchanged a look as well, and silently panted with exertion as they climbed up from a draw that cut into the ridge. They'd had a rough hike. The land and vegetation were unforgiving, and each was carrying an AR-style rifle. The two hunters carried short-barreled 12 GA shotguns, what they called pig guns. They all wore pistols and carried knives. Billy carried a machete in a sheath, but they'd mostly stuck to game trails. He hadn't had to use it much. The officer cursed as he stepped into a wet hole from where a tree had rotted in place. Ah, that's nasty. Cold, too. The others tried not to laugh. The holes were covered by pine straw and were difficult to spot, so it could have happened to any of them. He pulled his leg from the hole and shook off as much of the muck as he could. Well, they'd all pause for a moment, to ensure he hadn't twisted his ankle or knee. The deputy leaned his weight on the hand he placed against the trunk of a large uprooted oak tree as he caught his breath. Now I really need to get back in the gym, he thought as he heard a loud, deep, octave grunt and snort from the other side of the hole, where the top part of the tree began to spread into branches. All members of the party turned toward the sounds. They all knew what had made them. A feral hog. And then a tremendous beast appeared suddenly at the root end of the tree. It moved incredibly fast for such a large animal. Before any of the men could react, it was upon them. It directly struck Billy and pushed him into Travis, and then lifted both men into the air. Its rear flank crushed the deputy against the hard wood of the tree. The officer stood a few feet away from the rest and did a great job in bringing his rifle to bear, but about that time he felt something tear into the back of his left thigh. It entered just above the back of his knee joint, a spike that then tore upwards and ripped through his left buttock. He landed on his right side, rifle dropped and forgotten in his newfound agony. He didn't suffer long. Enormous porcine jaws clamped on his neck and he could have sworn he heard a snap before his vision faded down a long, dark corridor and sounds and sensations ceased. Another ghost for the storied Black Cat Ridge. Well, the others fared no better. The board burst through the group, then made an amazingly quick and agile 180-degree turn to charge back into their midst. He focused on Travis until the man lay in a ball around his own awful. Billy had been unable to rise. His right femur was broken, and he was already in shock. Fortunately, he clenched his eyes shut with the pain, and didn't see the steer-sized hoof that crushed his skull. The deputy had been bruised and winded, but otherwise he was not seriously injured. He watched on in horror, as the beast made it spin and again attacked the two hunters. He'd seen bulls at the rodeo make spins like that to get rid of riders, and then rapidly turn and try to gore them. Yet he was always amazed when such bulky creatures displayed highly dexterous acrobatics. He dropped the AR when the boar struck him, 
so he quickly drew his sight up. His peripheral vision noted a dark blur as a set of teeth buried into his forearm, and he was suddenly and painfully yanked from his feet and dragged along the side of the tree trunk. As they passed the roots, his other arm snagged and he came to a momentary halt. Then he felt his forearm separate from his elbow. The unlucky, or perhaps truly fortunate man, passed out from the pain and sudden blood loss, and so didn't feel the rest of what happened to his body. When the party did not report back to operations, the sheriff and the command group looked into where the team had been assigned to search. Crest of Black Cat Ridge. <laughs> Figures, he spat. Nothing good ever comes from that area, except when Harvey washed out the meth monkeys. He looked around at the commanders. It's getting dark. Probably best to plan and wait until morning. Early morning, maybe we can catch them while they're still stirring. One of the commanders piped up. What about the missing men? Are we just going to leave them out there? The sheriff offered the man a steely gaze. They got lost or worse in daylight. You've seen those woods. You want to go traipsing through them in the dark? He looked around at the others. Oh, we need a plan. Feral hogs are smart. They have a great sense of smell and are downright uncanny when it comes to spying traps. Any thoughts or suggestions? The game warden captain in charge of organizing the volunteer hunters took up the gauntlet. We have enough people to make a tiger hunt. No elephants but a couple of monster trucks may do the trick. The discussion went on for quite a while. At least they finally had a specific location to search. If the party had been attacked, it had happened in daylight, so they must have been near a wallow or a den. The plan would cover both a search and rescue operation and a hunt. So they all went to their various sleeping arrangements, confidently and satisfied. Before dawn, the entire emergency response group was on hand for a briefing, to include assignments. The mission would combine looking for the missing team members as well as trying to locate the hogs. The sheriff filled them in on the attack on the security guard. The security guard from one of the local companies was slaughtered the other night and his golf cart was shattered and scattered. Some of you may know him. I've heard his buddies call him Gollum. His real name was Fredericks. He paused and looked around for confirmation. There was none. Oh, there was another video recording. From the building, very clear. The big boar looks to stand around five feet at the hump on his shoulders and weighs in a good 800 to 1,000 very lean pounds. The tusks are abnormally long and there's an odd lump between his eyes. Oh, this master doesn't need the saber-toothed tusk to kill. It needs only to trample or crush. Now, yeah, time is short. We'll meet at the base of the ridge in ten minutes. Well, he knew it would take longer, but he needed them to comprehend the urgency. Everyone will shake out in a line. As we proceed, you will stay inside of the team members to your left and right. While time is a factor, safety is the greater consideration. Stay on line with the others. I cannot stress that enough. We've set up two all-wheel drive vehicles with shooting platforms on the other side of the ridge and at the bottom. They're already in place on the other side of the ridge, ready to ambush the killers once we flush them. If we fail to locate and neutralize the hogs, we may be able to drive them into range of our shooters. Once we've crested the ridge, we'll descend only a short way down the other side. We do not want anyone in the line of fire of the shooters on the trucks. Oh, by the way, don't worry about making noise. The more the better. Might as well drive the monsters ahead. Just a reminder, they are aggressive and may turn back on us, so be ready. He answered a few questions and then they were off on the hunt for the saber-toothed hawks. It took longer than anyone hoped to get everyone lined up and moving, but once they started it went mostly to plan. About 15 minutes in, a shot rang out near the north end of the line, followed by the staccato sound of several more rounds from different calibers. That stopped everyone in their tracks, as per the plan. It was hard for the team members to restrain themselves from sprinting to the aid of those who had fired. However, the firing stopped abruptly after the initial bursts. Then, the waiting began. Shortly, the sheriff sent over the radio that all was well, but that one sector had encountered an extra-large nutria that had attacked a team member. He requested that the team leader from the game wardens respond. He gave the order to move forward again, and everyone did so. 
on much higher doses of adrenaline. Just over the ridge, a team a little south of the crest came across a large tree that blocked their progress. They found weapons and a few other inedible items, large pools of dry blood and awful. The area stank, and flies that had grown to the size of horseflies buzzed around the sticky mess. This caused another brief pause, and evidence techs were deployed to the scene. Once they arrived, the line completed its push. No one had spotted the pigs. SWAT Officer Jenkins, who was an assigned sniper, lay prone on his mobile shooting platform. His spotter, Officer Tran, stood to shake off fatigue and to maintain a better view. There was a secondary spotter, a local hog hunter on the platform, and the driver sat stoically in his seat, looking around in every direction he could. Their vehicle was positioned closest to the river. It sat on oversized wheels and tires, so everyone was reasonably high off the ground. They were all pretty tired since they'd left late the night before to get into position in time for the early hunt. Well, it was a waking shock when they heard the radio traffic about the fate of the missing party. Crap, Jenkins thought. How many more? Soon he could hear the noise of the beaters as they came to a stop a safe distance out of the line of fire from either truck. The sheriff came over the radio and told the beaters to make some noise. Well, the first responders yelled and clapped their hands and whistled along with most of the volunteers, but sure enough, a few of those yahoos fired round. Apparently, they didn't understand the concept of gravity. The rounds had to come down somewhere, and there were far too many people in the area. There was a quick and angry broadcast of Cease Fire, repeated until well after the last shot. This was followed by a tense reminder that firearms were to be used only when they faced a life-threatening situation. Well, at least the wait isn't boring, he thought as he looked up and winked at Officer Tran, who smirked, shook his head and mouthed, Dumbasses. That was when a rumble of hooves and a loud boom erupted from the passenger's side of the truck, and the entire vehicle tipped a little toward the driver's side. There was another rumble of hooves, and before the vehicle could tip back, an even greater impact. This time it tipped most of the way. Grunting squeals deepened and increased in volume to a surrealistic level, roared as another impact finished the job and rolled the truck onto its side, and then onto its top. The boar and the larger, older sow stood looking on in satisfaction. Their long hair was matted with mud from their early morning wallow. They had spotted the ambush on the way back to the den, and had decided to conduct one of their own. They had left the younger sow down by the river. She was slow and gravid, getting ready to have her little ones. In the truck... The driver dangled upside down, caught in his seatbelt. Officer Tran and the civilian hunter had fallen when the truck rolled. The hunter had jumped free, but lost his life. Tran and Jenkins managed to end up on the ground with the bed of the truck and the roll bar keeping the mass above them. Tran was curled around a broken arm. Jenkins, while stunned by the suddenness of the attack, still had hold of his rifle. He turned dizzily toward the two brutish swine. The big male eyed the truck and pawed at the ground. The sow had started a loping run that would build up momentum for another strike. As she came around face forward, Jenkins had time to get his muzzle in line and fire. He fired two more rounds in quick succession, and the sow screamed as the fifty caliber rounds struck her in the chest and penetrated her vital organs. Her carcass skidded to a stop about a foot from the side of the truck and Jenkins' view was entirely blocked. He rolled toward the driver's side and scrambled to his feet. Tran! He reached under the truck and grabbed hold of Officer Tran's collar. He pulled backwards as hard as he could to get clear of the truck. Had the ball flipped the truck over again, they would have made it. Instead, there was a loud crash from the front of the truck, and the front end, engine and all, spun towards them at tremendous speed. The impact sent both men sprawling into the underbrush, both of them stunned and helpless. Jenkins could hear the sounds of shouts and the rumble of many running feet as the beta crew poured down the ridge to rescue them. He managed to open his eyes and look toward the ruined truck, just as the boar rounded the front and glared at him with furious eyes. 
the truck had made a full 360 degree turn with the atop of the cab as an axis. The bore poured at the ground, bristled its mane, then, just as it squatted to begin a trampling charge, a shot rang out, followed rapidly by eleven more. Bore stumbled away from the cab area of the truck and fell onto its side. Everyone had forgotten about the driver, who carried a forty-five caliber pistol with high-powered ammunition. He emptied the entire magazine into the neck of the monster hog from no more than three feet, and he was a good shot, despite being shaken and dizzy and dangling upside down. The saber-tooth horror struggled to regain its feet, though it bled profusely. About that time, the beaters and the hunter who had been thrown clear when the porcine terrors hit the truck arrived and added their own rounds to the mix, and eventually the boar hog stilled and expelled its last breath. The photos and video footage were impressive. The head would eventually be mounted at the sheriff's office and featured in election poster photos. Jenkins and Tran made a full recovery, and the shy driver, Hunter, ended up making the talk shows as the hero that brought down the saber-toothed feral hog. The funerals for the party of dead searchers were massive, and vied with election news coverage in the media and social media for the next two weeks. Hunters were scheduled to come in and remove or destroy the other affected fauna. The only argument was which agency would pay for the hunters. On the other side of the San Jacinto River, the younger sow nursed her litter. Their new den was a little low-lying and swampy for her tastes, but she would tolerate it until the piglets were weaned. That would best be soon, she thought in pork and ease. My little balls already have tusks, and they're uncomfortable to suckle. So I guess if there was a moral to that story, it would be do not give crystal meth to pigs, because the outcome is not good at all, <laughs> as you'd pretty much imagine, I would say. Well, yeah, uh, pretty good story, that one. A uh, bit different from what I'd normally read. Hope you liked uh, joining me around the campfire. I haven't done that for a while. Um, big things lined up for Wednesday. Um, if I get my ass into gear, we've got a two-hour story coming on Wednesday evening. One hell of a story, I can tell you. Well, yeah, better stop talking now, hadn't I? Get on with it. <laughs> okay, then. Until then, sweet dreams, my dear friends, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>